Hello, and welcome back to this retrospective series on the Legions and their Primarchs. I am the Darklight Emissary, here to guide you through a brief overview of each of these Legions and their Primarchs. This episode is on the 15th Legion, the A Thousand Sons, and their Primarch, the Crimson King, Magnus the Red. And so, this Legion is my personal favorite. Um, I've loved them ever since. Uh, the book A Thousand Sons about them have come out. And I believe that, kind of start off with the overview of this legion, um, at the height of the Great Crusade and during that era with Magnus the Red, uh, the Thousand Sons represented the best possible future for the Imperium and the level of enlightenment that the Emperor and the Imperium wanted to bring to humanity. Um, of course, that didn't happen. Uh, but uh, that was the ideal that they represented, at least in my mind. I'm going to do my level best to keep this uh, the same length as the other uh, videos, because again, this is meant to be a brief overview, but I have to kind of contain myself because I can kind of wax a bit long about this Legion if I let myself. But uh, so to get on with it, uh, the Thousand Suns as a uh, force were a smaller Legion than most. Uh, they had more than 1000 Marines, but due to different events, uh, they kept being faded to drop to 1,000 Marines or less at times throughout their history. And um, the Legion uh, as a whole was unique in that nearly the entire Legion were psychers or uh, had psychic ability of some level. And so despite them being a smaller Legion, they could punch well above their weight because they could augment their normal you know, powerful space marine fighting abilities with powerful psychic abilities. Um, you've got very powerful psychers amongst their numbers, like uh, Ahriman, uh, who is the uh, chief librarian and basically the first captain of the uh, Mag of the uh, Legion. Uh, Magnus himself is second only to the Emperor as a powerful psychic. And the Legion... Uh, were big on seeking out knowledge and enlightenment wherever they went. Um, they would bring planets to compliance like normal, like most of the other legions, but this legion was not very destructive, uh, at least they tried not to be, uh, compared to other legions. They would straight up at one point during the Cru Great Crusade, they protect the library from being burned down uh, by the Space Wolves, and that's one of the you know main... Uh, where one of their main rivalries kind of sparked and started was protecting that library during a compliance action on a world called Shrike. And Lorgar, of all people, had to stop Russ from attacking Magnus directly. Um, yeah, because Russ, being kind of a uh, braggart and a bit of a uh, stubborn individual, had to be protected or had to be uh, called off by another Primarch. And uh, wrapped into this, uh, one of the main drawbacks to this Legion, and what kind of kept their numbers smaller, at least to begin with, was this Legion, before reuniting with Magnus, was suffering greatly from an instability in their gene seed called uh, a flesh change. And this would turn them into basically into chaos spawn, although they weren't called that at the time. Um, and for some reason not elaborated on, the Emperor was unable to stop this and it seemed like only reuniting with Magnus the Red had, would give them any chance to stop that change. But uh, as you learn through, you know, if you read the books of these guys, Magnus the Red, the way he was able to um, stop the change was by making a pact with Zench, the god of change in the warp. And, um, uh, Zench is not a trustworthy, out of all the Chaos Gods, Zench is probably the least trustworthy uh, out of any pact you make with any of those gods. I don't recommend any of them making a pact with, but Zench, least of all, he, uh, Zench is known for plots and deceit and uh, just, uh, he's known as the architect of fate. He's not, he's not one you want to make a pact with, but uh, Magnus did not really understanding what he was making a pact with, and that's what stabilized his legion for a time, as long as it suited Zench's machinations at that point. And so, 
right before uh, the uh, Horus Heresy kicks off, um, Zench and X's plan to remove the Thousand Suns from the uh, equation because the Thousand Suns, uh, being you know sorcerers and being powerful psychic users, uh, would have been a great power against the uh, forces of chaos during the Horus Heresy era. So they really did not want the Thousand Suns on the Loyalist side. On top of that, Magnus was um, given the role by the Emperor to sit on the Golden Throne as his ne next most powerful psyker next to himself. His ultimate goal was to sit on the Golden Throne so that the Emperor could remain active and animate uh, without having to sit on it himself. But uh, Magnus becomes aware that Horus ha is being corrupted by Erebus and the Wordbearers Legion. And so Magnus uh, does his best to try to stop this. He enters into a psychic state and uh, tries to, you know, convince Horus not to go down the road, but he fails. So then after that failure, he uh, decides he's going to send a psychic message to the Emperor and he goes psychically instead of directly there like he should have. Um, he go he decides to do it faster by going psychically and he um, breaks into the Emperor's uh, palace through the webway um, with the help of Zench and uh, permanently shatters uh, the plans that the Emperor had for the webway project um, and that's what kicks off the Horus Heresy in earnest because now the Emperor has to sit on the Golden Throne or all of Terra will be consumed by uh, a tide, endless tide of demons trying to coming in through the terror that Magnus uh, loosed in the webway. Uh, so that's how the horse heresy really starts is through that. And um, to kind of stay, take a step back just for a second, um, I missed an important point. During the Great Crusade, uh, Magnus was kind of a pariah for some of his brothers because he was uniquely gifted in psychic ability and just based upon his just look in general he's was the most mutant and different looking from his brothers he was a giant red one-eyed cyclops he was known as a cyclops and kind of a derogatory term he still had two eyes although his second eye was like distorted and like bigger and would change colors it was a kind of a symbol of his pact with zench so Again, I don't know why the Emperor didn't notice that that was a chaos, you know, blessing. Um, I mean, Magnus didn't seem to know it at the time either. Uh, but it, I just find it interesting that that uh, the Emperor didn't really bring this up because the Emperor knew all about chaos, even if he held it secret from his sons. Um, exactly the true nature of what the ruinous powers were for a long time in the Great Crusade. Uh, but I digress. Uh, it's just an interesting point I wanted to bring up there. Um, and so, due to breaking open the, the palace and all of that, um, you know, Magnus realized his mistake and he decided to, uh, you know, accept punishment from his father in the form that it would come to his world. And the Emperor uh, decided to send the Space Wolves and Russ. And uh, he also sent a contingent of uh, custodes his personal guard along with the captain of that guard Valdor uh, and uh, a contingent of silent sisterhood uh, which are basically psychic blanks and he also sent Ordo Sinister Titans I mean th this censure fleet sent to Prospero and to Tizca the capital of Prospero was a very powerful force uh, because they knew how powerful this legion was when roused and so they were expecting a brutal conflict um, to bring Magnus back and uh, in chains to Terra. That was the goal, at least to start off with. But uh, for some odd reason, you know, with well, not odd reason, as we talked about with Space Wolves uh, in their um, time on this episode, on these episodes, the Space Wolves were for some reason special to the Emperor um, and given special tasks. And so it wasn't, it's not that odd in that perspective why they sent Russ and the wolves, but it is in the sense of like the wolves were known for hating the Thousand Sons. 
like with a fervor that most of the other legions didn't. Um, and the legions uh, before Magnus even showed uh, showed up on in the picture, a lot of the legions wanted to just expunge the Thousand Suns completely. They thought they were um, a lost cause with the flesh change, and uh, there was a, a call from several of them, like Rogal Dorn, Mortarion, Orax. Uh, a bunch of them were saying, hey, we should just get rid of the, these guys. They're, they're worthless at, you know, like, and dangerous at, at best. Um, but Magnus, of course, you know, bringing them back from the brink kind of put an argument against that. But Magnus is also greatly criticized by his brothers. And so um, his entire legion had gotten censured by the emperor already at the Council of Nikea, it's called, where... Uh, the Emperor was convinced by the detractors against psychic powers to ban psychic powers throughout all of the legions. And this, again, doesn't really make much sense with the Emperor knowing that to fight chaos, you kind of have to use psychic ability. I mean, the Emperor is the most powerful psyker in arguably the entire setting. Why he would just outright ban one of his best tools just to appease some of his other Primarchs? Who knows? Because eventually... As the Horse Heresy progresses, uh, this ban is basically ignored outright by loyalists or lifted uh, to bring back psychers to help fight the forces of chaos and the demons that are coming and the Thousand Suns themselves. Because um, as uh, the center host fleet approaches, um, Magnus the Red basically sabotages his forces any chances to prepare, doesn't tell them that they are coming because he believes that. You know, he personally deserves this punishment because Magnus the Red, um, I haven't really talked about him personally, but Magnus the Red is, uh, I mean, he's at the top of the list for a Primarch that I would want to work for because he really wanted all of his men to be scholars. He wanted all humans to be scholars. Uh, if you spent any time on Tizka, uh, you know, it's a sparkling city with giant glass pyramids and gold and there's it's like it's almost like you know the lost library of alexandria type of place where you know like you could go sit at a class being taught by ahriman about some topic you know like they would teach histories and you know it was a place of learning and growth and scholarship and uh again like kind of what i mentioned at the beginning of this they represented to me you know like kind of a hopeful future scenario and by taking them down, by burning them, the Imperium kind of took their first step into the despotic future that we see them in later on in the 40k era. And so um, the center fleet approaches and uh, Russ is told by Horus, you know, you should, instead of arresting Magnus, you should just kill him. He's going to be too much trouble to bring him back because for some reason, at, you know, Hor Russ did not, I guess, believe Magnus that Horus was corrupted yet. Uh, despite the message being sent directly to the Emperor, um, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things that Russ apparently just let, you know, his hatred for his brother um, outweigh any rationality in his decision making. So they attack Prospero with a withering force. They burn the entire world. The only Tiska survives because some of the Thousand Suns have a psychic shield over the planet, uh, holding back the worst of the orbital bombardment. And then the wolves, along with the Custodes and the Sisters of Silence and Order of Sinister, descend upon the world and do battle with the Thousand Suns. And so uh, Ahriman and the Thousand Suns do not agree with Magnus it is her punishment, and so they fight, and they fight the best they can. One of the Thousand Suns pilots a Titan psychically and it, and his powers are fire and he basically goes around with a giant fire Titan just burning enemies wherever he can for a while until uh, events turn against him but uh, just an interesting point there There's a lot of things with the Thousand Suns they, they manipulate with their psychic abilities their power levels so far beyond a normal marine would you know some of them control entire psychically controlled maniples of robots they just do a bunch of things that they have to do to kind of punch them out their own weight. And so they're using these forces against uh, the, the wolves and the custodes and the Sisters of Silence. And 
they're they're you know they're dealing a bloody nose but they're not doing enough and they're eventually pushed back to the great pyramid of tiska where magnus is uh watching and eventually uh magnus comes down from the pyramid and uh at this point the sky is bloody purple and distorted and there's like eyes and mouths and things appearing in the sky because you know zench has come to watch his machinations come forth and zench wanted both of these legions destroyed completely uh and due to magnus not engaging in full battle that did not happen magnus knew that the wolves would be needed and so magnus being honestly being you know still trying to serve the imperium despite them not serving him at all uh you know did not want to destroy the wolves despite him not liking them and them definitely not liking him and so magnus and russ do battle and uh eventually um russ strikes a blow on magnus's eye and uh breaks his back and magnus is near death and he looks to the remains of his sons about a thousand of them left and he says you know here's my final gift to you and he utters some arcane ancient uh spell and uh, all the thousand sons you'll see in some of the artwork they each have like a purple uh like jade gemstone area in their armor and inside of that each of them uh those start glowing and then magnus disappears into the ground and all of the thousand sons disappear along with him and they are transported to a world known as the uh, planet of sorcerers that Zench has prepared for them in the war. And uh, so after that happens, uh, the Thousand Sons for a long time still do not join Horus's cause. They don't really have an interest in toppling the Imperium like the rest of the traitors do. Uh, Magnus has his own goals uh, that I won't go into here. And he does eventually fall in with the traitors and helps uh, assault Terra and get them to the Siege of Terra. Uh, Ahriman helps, uh, Magnus helps, but uh, events happen on Terra itself to transpire that eventually, finally, turns Magnus the Red into a demon prince of Zench and locks him in his legion's place as a damned legion of chaos. And so uh, they are a legion that also, you know, like they leave through the warp basically after the events of the Siege of Terra. And they, uh, for the most part, um, broke up into war bands, but not because they, uh, you know, couldn't be called back by Magnus the Red. They just had no need to stay as a Legion force, but they were, they did not really break up like permanently or any by any means. But, um, during the 40k era, they've been a fairly busy, mostly focusing assaults against the space wolves for uh, you know see the rest of this video reasons um and uh i consider the thousand suns the most justified in their current 40k motives out of any of the chaos legions they they are a legion that you know was uh by malkador the sigilites own admins you know it was, a, it was a mistake and a failure on their part that they assaulted the thousand suns like they did they would have sent nearly any other loyalist primarch. The the Thousand Sons, Magnus would have come back to Terra to talk to the Emperor, and the the Horus Heresy might not have happened nearly the way it did. Um, but you know, that's the part of the setting. You know, Zench is a deceitful, powerful god in the warp, and you know he transpired against them to twist one of the Emperor's best assets against him. That's kind of Zench, Zench's entire thing, is to do stuff like that. Um, and one other interesting thing of note about the Thousand Suns is the flesh change came back when they fell to chaos finally. And Ahriman uh, enacted what's called the Rubric um, to try to save his legion from the flesh change. It worked, but it turned most of his legion into automatons. They, their physical bodies turned to dust, and they were locked in their armor as spirits, basically. And the remainder that stayed as psychers and stayed as librarians uh, became more powerful, but at the cost of most of the Legion being kind of mindless automatons now uh, that can be led into battle by a sorcerer, but 
they have no personality or anything like that. So uh, Magnus the Red was not pleased with this and banished Akriwan and his cabal from the planet sorcerers permanently. And he was ordered to, you know, seek out the meaning of Zench or, you know, something to that effect, which is basically an impossible task. So it was kind of cursed to wander forever seeking that. And Akriwan ever since has been trying to seek his way into the Black Library of um, the Eldar. And if he's able to break in there, it's speculated he could become a god of his own, right? Um, Akriwan is one of those powerful psychers, you know, right after Magnus and the Emperor. And uh, one of the more interesting notes about Akriwan is uh, he's the champion of Zench, but he does not see himself as that at all. I don't think he sees himself as a worshiper of chaos at all. And... Uh, one of his fellow sorcerers actually claims that, uh, you know, when he saw Ahriman last, instead of a face, all there was left of Ahriman was a hole where his face used to be. But in Ahriman's mind, he looks exactly the same as he always has, all the way back from his time on Terra, where he was from. Uh, and it would be just like Zench to allow his top servant uh, to believe that he was free of any chains that he would put him in. That's prime Zench style. Um, Zench kind of has a sense of humor that way. Uh, but anyway, uh, so overall in 40k, they've been very active though. Arhuman and his Cabal are very active. Uh, the They operate differently than other Chaos Legions though. Like I said, they mostly focus any assaults on the Space Wolves. If they show up anywhere else, they're usually raiding a library or trying to find an artifact and then leaving. So they're a bit unique that way. Like I said, they, they stayed somewhat the same despite being uh, in the service of Zench. Uh, Zench is also a god of knowledge and power, and magic, so uh, it definitely fits that the Thousand Suns would have been coveted by them, or uh, by him. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Zench has proven in some ways to be a better master than the Emperor was. The Emperor failed the Thousand Suns miserably, and he definitely got karmic results for that. So, uh, I'm going to stop the retrospective here on them. Uh, as always, um, like and subscribe if you'd like to hear more of these. Uh, and I'm going to try to get a few of these out. I'm going to be gone this weekend. And so, you know, I'm going to try to get one out for releasing for each day of the weekend. And I'm not going to be here. Um, and as always, bring your light into the dark places. The next lead we've got going on is none other than the Ark Traders Legion himself the Luna Wolves, or as they're known later as the Sons of Horus and Lupercal himself, Horus. So that'll be a fun one. Uh, they're a great legion to talk about as, you know, the main legion behind the heresy, uh, at least the face of it, I should say. Uh, the 17th legion, we have a bit to talk about as well, and they're meddling. Um, and uh, so as always, uh, I will see you in the next one and I hope you have a great day or night wherever you are. Thank you and good night.